are calling to more order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for August 31st, 2020. As a preliminary matter, this is John Hurd, Chair of the Select Board. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan. Here. Joseph Carl. Here. Stephen DeCourcy. Here. And Lynn Diggins. Here. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapteling. Here. Doug Heim. Present. And Board Administrator Ashley Marr is participating remotely. Good evening. This meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth given the outbreak of, outbreak of the novel coronavirus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along in the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Even if members of the public do not provide comment, participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. For this meeting, the select board is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please also take care to adjust your screen or device name if you would like to speak. In order for us to recognize speakers appropriately and develop accurate minutes, it is helpful for participants to see your full first and last name when calling upon you rather than a nickname. All of the meeting materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available on Novus, the Novus Agenda dashboard, and we recommend the members in the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus unless the chair notes otherwise. We're now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. This meeting will feature opportunities for public comment on certain agenda items. After members have spoken, I as the chair will afford public comment opportunities as follows. I will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all public commentators, I will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comment. Please be, keep in mind that all participants and members of the public must be recognized by the chair before speaking. Finally, each vote tonight will be taken by a roll call vote. All right. And that takes us to the second item on the agenda, which is a proclamation for Hunger Action Day, which I have right here. And um, is Andy Doan on the list of attendees? So yes, would you, like me to, would you like me to promote yep. her? Okay. Hi, Andy. How are you? Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. Sure. You can just state your name and your position, then I'll read the proclamation. 
Uh, Andy Doan, Executive Director of Arlington Eats. Thank you. All right. So the proclamation signed by the members of the select board. Whereas Feeding America has designated September as Hunger Action Month and September 10th as Hunger Action Day to raise awareness about hunger and inspire neighbors to take action. And whereas in, in Arlington, an estimated 4,530 people, roughly 10% of the total population, are at risk for food insecurity. And whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the issue of food insecurity throughout the region. And whereas before the pandemic, approximately one in 13 residents of Eastern Massachusetts experienced food insecurity. In 2020, one in eight residents of Eastern Massachusetts are projected, projected to experience food insecurity. Child food insecurity is projected to rise at a greater rate with one in six children now at risk to experience hunger. And whereas the town of Arlington recognizes that Arlington Eats, Arlington Council on Aging, Food Link, and Arlington Public Schools have worked in partnership to address food insecurity in this community and acknowledges that, that they have increased services dramatically since the onset of the pandemic. And whereas the number of neighbors served by Arlington Eats has increased 60%, Eats now distributes approximately 9,000 pounds of food and makes 220 to 250 deliveries per week. And whereas Foodlink has collected 90,000 pounds of food, twice the usual amount, provided the equivalent of 75,000 meals to those in need and distributed food to 15 new community partners. And whereas Arlington Council on, on Aging has acted as a communication hub to connect all residents to food resources and has undertaken focused outreach to Arlington seniors. Whereas since April, Arlington Public Schools has been providing weekly deliveries of free breakfast and lunch to children and teens facing food insecurity in Arlington. APS deliveries currently serve approximately 220 children and teens per week. Now therefore be it resolved that the town of Arlington encourages any resident in need of food to call the Arlington Food Hotline at 781-316-3400 or visit arlingtoneats.org. In resolve that the town of Arlington encourages residents to support efforts to alleviate food insecurity by volunteering and donating money or food when they are able. In resolve that September 10th, 2020 shall be proclaimed as Hunger Action Day in Arlington and that all residents are encouraged to take cognizance of this event and participate fittingly in its observance. So moved. Andy, thank you for being for coming on to the meeting and all that you do. If you, anything you want to address the board, you can do so. Yeah, I just want to thank the select board and the town of Arlington for recognizing uh, hunger. We've always known it's been an issue in Arlington, but of course with the pandemic, um, it's even more so now. And um, we're just grateful that um, we can all work together as a community to ensure that uh, no uh, child, no family, or no senior goes hunger, uh, hungry here in Arlington. So thank you for this proclamation and uh, for the community, we can work together to make sure that we can eliminate hunger here in Arlington. Thank you. And I'll turn to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. Mr. Dickens? You are muted. Sorry about that. I was unmuted and then unmuted it. Uh, uh, I, I hear it was, uh, it was, there was a motion by um, Ms. Kuro. I'm not sure if it's seconded. Um, if not, then I'm happy to second it. And so, um, and also to add, you know, that I fully support this. I think it's really good work. As you noted, it was a problem um, before the pandemic. And, and, and you, know, you know, I'm glad we're doing this, but, but we as a, you know, as a region, as a country, just got to do a lot more, and I think you know, living wage would go a long way towards being um, solving this problem. Um, you know, a host of other problems, including housing, healthcare, and everything else. And the more I'm involved, the more I'm really determined, you know, to do some work on that. Because I mean, that statistic about I mean, uh, net value of a white household being two hundred fifty thousand dollars and that of a black household being $8 is a problem. You know, I mean, it's not only across just those two races. I mean, it's a, it's a problem in terms of just poverty in general. And I've done a little bit of math. And it seems to me that if you took $15,000 I mean, from 
of that net worth, mean, and, and gave it to the, the minority families in some way or another, you would bring them up to $185,000. That's not a whole lot of, of money, you know, I mean, I think as a region, um, we can do that. We just have to have the will to do that. And, and um, so thank you for what you're doing and, and we'll do more. Yep. Mr. Carl. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Andy. It's good to see you. Um, th thank you very much for bringing this forward. Uh, 4,530 people, with, uh, food insecurity in the town is, is a big number. Um, you you uh, note, you know, it's noted further down the resolution that um, the number of neighbors served by Arlington Eats has increased 60%. Is that since the pandemic began? Yeah. Point? Yeah, that's um, uh, late April's. We actually had our, hit our peak, about 250 families we were serving every week. Uh, it dropped down a little bit in May and June and July. And then just this past month, uh, it's gone back up to 250. Uh, we think pro most likely it's because of the reduce, the reduction in- um, um, Unemployment. Uh, and yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the lingering effects of the pandemic. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you for all the work that you do. and, and uh, your partners as well in the town. It's, it's, a, it's a great partnership, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ms. Mahan. Um, <clears throat> thank you to Andy and everyone with Arlington Eats. Um, uh, I have two questions, which I think I know both the answers to, but um, my two questions are when people ask about when is the time that we can drop off um, to Arlington Eats, Food Links? I think I know the answer. And then my second question is, how are we getting out that information on where you can donate to Arlington Eats, what the current need is, whether it's gluten-free, peanut butter, or whatever, and, and how that word is getting out. So, so the blanket thing would be, you know, what's sort of the general time, place, day to drop things off, and then how do we find out where to drop it and what we should drop? Yeah, great question, Diane. Uh, so we accept food donations on Tuesdays from 1 to 4 p.m. And we're currently located at St. John's Church, uh, 74 Pleasant Street. Uh, we do, they're on the corner of Pleasant and Lombard Road. And so we actually have tables set up on Lombard Road so you can drop off your donation there um, with contactless so you don't have to interact with anybody. Um, and in terms of what our needs are, they, they keep evolving and changing. So for instance, we recognized earlier this summer that we were getting a lot of requests for diapers. Um, and adult incontinent products. So we put out the call for that. So the best way to find out is go to our website, arlingtoneeds.org, or follow us on Facebook. We post regularly on there what the current needs are. Uh, and we're just so grateful for the way the community supports us. We get a lot of our food from the Greater Boston Food Bank at um, incredibly reduced price, but there's these interesting things, or you know, most recently is now sun butter. Uh, we can't get a hold of that anywhere. So that's where we're asking for um, community donations. So, that's an important piece that the community can play in donating food to us. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. DeCorsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Andy, thank you very much for all the work you're doing at Arlington Eats and I'm happy to, to support this proclamation. And we have it in the resolution, but I can't emphasize enough that if people are in need of food, that the food hotline is listed there in the Arlington Eats website. Um, is, is listed as well. And anything we can do as a town to, to, to get that word out for people in need, but, you know, we, we should do that. But thank you for all your efforts. Thank you. All right. And just to clarify, Mr. Carr, do you make a motion to receive? A, a motion to adopt the, result, the, the proclamation as written. Yep. And second by Mr. Diggins. All right, and thank you, Andy, for coming. You know, I've been involved with Eats for a couple of years, back was the food pantry, and I'm just amazed at the work that everyone does, especially Andy, that, that where she's been with us for a few years, and where it is now from where it was when she started is just an amazing transformation. And the amount of work that they do is, is mind boggling. So thank you for all you do. All right, so we have a motion from Mr. Carl. Seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Hein. Ms. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Curo. Yes. Mr. Hurd. 
Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you, and thank you, Andy. All right, so the next item on the agenda is our consent agenda. So we have meeting of minutes, August 17th, 2020. Then we have appointment of new election workers, Lisa Blankspor, 11 Webb Cowett Road, Precinct 9, Chris Brummel, 65 Park Street, unit number one, Precinct 8, Jennifer Goble, 89 Sunset Road, Precinct 13, Emily Hoffman, 79 Park Street, Precinct 10, Diane Kaplan, 65 Park Street, Unit 1, Precinct 10, Rebecca Kittredge, 46 Teal Street, Unit 2, Precinct 3, Sherry McNeil, 9 Walnut Court, Precinct 12, Vanessa Rinesmith, 60 Brooks Avenue, Precinct 4, Karen Roach, 43 Beverly Road, Precinct 11, Elizabeth Sartori, 3309 Sim Circle, Precinct 16, Wendy Seltzer, 176 Pleasant Street, Precinct 4. And I will look to Mr. DeCourcy for a motion. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Move uh, approval of both items in the consent agenda. Thank you. And Ms. Mahan? Oh, second that motion by Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you. All right. Any comments, Mr. Diggins? No comments. And Mr. Caro? No comments. All right. Attorney Heim? Ms. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Curo? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. And that takes us to appointments. So we have two appointments to the Traffic Advisory Committee to fill unexpired terms. One is Dewis Jones, term to expire December 31st, 2020, and Shoji Takahashi, term to expire December 31st, 2022. So I see so I'll bring him in. I don't see uh, uh, Ray. Yeah, I think I think he goes by Ray. Right. Uh, um, but I'll I'll keep an eye for him if he joins while <clears throat> we're talking with Mr. Takahashi. Hi, Mr. Takahashi. How are you? Hi, everyone. You want to just tell us your name and a little bit about why you wanted to join the Traffic Advisory Committee. My name is Shoji Takahashi. I live here on Mountain Avenue, uh, right across the street from Stratton Elementary School. I've been involved in the Safe Routes to School program for a few years here, and I've been a bicycle commuter from Arlington to Cambridge for more than a decade now. Uh, so I've had a lot of interactions both with uh, cyclers and pedestrians, and of course we drive around um, our, our two kids. And I would love to be involved a little bit more, um, see the goings on behind the scenes and perhaps uh, learn a little bit how the town operates, but also provide some, some feedback from my experience using all those modalities to uh, hopefully get designs that uh, are designed for all walks of life. Great, thank you. And thank you for your willingness to serve. Um, Mr. Diggins, any questions, comments, motions? No, uh, well, I'll, I'll motion to uh, approve of, of, the, of Mr. Um, Taka, I'm sorry, I don't have your last name here, um, of the candidate uh, for, for, uh, for, for the Transportation Advisory uh, Committee. You know, you'll be seeing more of me because uh, I'm, I'm on the committee. I represent um, ACMI uh, as the, um, the member of the the Chamber of Commerce meet, so I'm looking forward to working with you. Mr. Carl? No, just uh, th th uh, I'll second the motion and, and just uh, say uh, thank you, Dr. Takahashi. Um, um, glad to see that the Stratton uh, um, Safe Routes of School program is still alive and well um, since the days that my kids were up there. Thank you. And Mrs. Mahan? And um, thank you, um, Dr. Takahashi, and um, 
I have looked over your resume, curriculum vitae, whichever is appropriate. And once again, with a lot of volunteers that we have in Arlington, we're very fortunate that we, we probably couldn't afford you if we had to pay for you. Um, but since we're getting you on a volunteer basis, it, it's definitely the right price range. And, and I do appreciate you and your family's um, commitment um, to volunteer in this way, because I know while you're the person up front, it's also your family uh, allowing you to do this. So I, I'm very appreciative of it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank Dr. Takahashi for your willingness to serve the community on the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee. Thank you. And again, thank you for serving this. We put a lot of stress on this committee. We, a lot of stuff comes through here and, and we push it off to you. So it, it has a full plate. So hope, I know you're, you're ready to, to get after it. All right, so on a motion to approve by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Carroll, Attorney Heim. Ms. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Carroll. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. And Mr. Chaplin, is Mr. Jones with us? I do not see him. Uh, if the chair is so inclined i can keep an eye out for him over the course of the meeting and let you know if he does join sure and i will turn to um mr decorsi if the board so chooses if we want to approve mr jones and then if he's in you know we'll invite him back in to introduce himself sure uh, thank you mr chairman and uh, we did receive information in the agenda a package and, and the recommendation from the transportation advisory committee so I'll move appointment of Mr. Jones uh, to the TAC. All right, and Mr. Mahan? I will second that and I will ask the chair or add them through the chair and see there's a, under attendees, there's a phone number that ends at 967. I don't know if that might be Mr. Jones or if that's something else. So I'll leave that to Mr. Chaplain and the chair to decipher. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Sure. I suppose I can say if that if that is Mr. Jones, if he could uh, hit star nine, that would raise his hand, and oh, I could, thank you. Uh, I, that could uh, he could identify himself that way. Okay, please continue uh, through the chair. Thank you, Mr. Hart. And yeah, Mr. Diggins, any comments, questions? Um, no comments. Just seems to be something in the water at Kendall Square because they're both like at the Whitehead and the Broad Institute. Okay? So, so I'm, I'm looking at his um, his CV and and uh, that analysis he did. I mean, he's going to be. Um, they're both going to be really great on the committee. Looking forward to it. Great. Thank you, and Mr. Carl. No, uh, nothing more other than I was really impressed with the. Uh, uh, quantitative analysis that, that the candidate uh, did of the um, the uh, uh, bus rapid transit pilot. Thank you. All right, and Ms. Chaplin, I assume no raised hand functions on that number. No, nothing. Thank you. All right, Attorney Heim, so on a motion by Mr. DeCourcy, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Ms. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Curo. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. All right. And that will take us to our open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there's a three minute time limit to present a concern or, or a request. So at this point, if you could use the raise hand function, if you'd like to speak at open forum. There are no raised hands, Mr. Chair. All right. Five seconds. All right, and that will put a close to our open forum. So we have, a, that brings us to traffic rules and order. We haven't 
few items on here. What I'm going to do at the request of one of our participants is bump up our discussion of the special town meeting, which is number nine. We'll take that out of order and take that first. So that's an update and discussion of special town meeting. Uh, Mr. Chaplin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'll give a brief update and then I believe Mr. Diggins can also uh, share as he and I have been attending meetings together. And I know you've been attending um, uh, several of these discussions as well, Mr. Hurd. So I believe we were able to inform the board at the last meeting of a success. Well, actually, no, I think at the last meeting we were the day before a meeting we were planning with uh, the Lexington board, the Lexington moderator, uh, and other staff from Lexington, the town manager, uh, and an analyst to learn about their process. We had that meeting. I think we learned a lot about their process, uh, the level of volunteer work that would be necessary and the level of tech support that would be necessary from both the volunteer and town staff point of view. Um, so we, we learned how they did it. Uh, we then followed up last week with um, a more detailed conversation with the member of the Lexington Select Board that actually wrote the sort of, I guess you call it the adjunct program to Zoom that helped them manage their virtual town meeting. Uh, and uh, that was myself, Mr. Diggins, and Eric Helmuth, who was really instrumental in bringing electronic town meeting voting uh, to town a couple of years ago. And I think that really helped us build out, or at least for Len and Eric, uh, I'm less technically savvy than they are, but uh, a better understanding of how the platform could work for us and what would need to happen uh, from today forward to be able to conduct a town meeting later this year. Uh, we then got a proposal from uh, Mr. Pato in Lexington, not in his role as a select board member, but as the individual who wrote that program, which seems very reasonable to us. So I think we're in um, I think we're in a position where there's a lot of work to do between now and town meeting to do this, but we think it's doable and practicable. Um, so I, I I feel good about it. I don't want to speak for him, but my sense is that Eric Helmuth agreed. I think the moderator is feeling good uh, about our ability to do it, uh, and I'll I'll let Mr. Diggins speak for himself. But I think we're in good position to make this happen. Um, the only additional thing I'll share that we, I did learn, and I, I think it's, I only offer this because I think we should, we could all keep this framework in mind that um, though Lexington did this in the spring, they did not conduct their full town meeting uh, in terms of going through every warrant article and coming to a conclusion on it. In fact, what they told us is their virtual town meeting looked much like ours, that there was a consent agenda with a lot of yeses and a consent agenda with a lot of no actions and uh, in a few substantive articles that they worked their way through. So I only offer that in, um, I think there will be learning here, right? They, they kicked it off sooner than they did, but haven't gone through a full uh, multi, you know, multi-debate type town meeting yet. Um, I think they're planning to do that this fall. So uh, just before we would be planning to do it, so we might still get some further wisdom from them. But um, I think both Lexington is learning, will be learning, and the other communities that are trying to do this will be learning as we go. Yeah. And Mr. Diggins? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm enthusiastic I mean, about it. I mean, the hard part is going to be uh, the training part. I mean, I'm a little concerned that, that the timeline has the training starting a little, a bit later than I wanted it to, but that will um, incent us to at least have the trainers in place, I mean, uh, who are going to help train the town meeting members, because I think it's very important that town meeting members take a lot of the responsibility for training, because uh, we're going to need staff to continue doing what it takes to operate this town, especially since we're in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, and so I don't think we can really place the onus of training on the town staff. So a lot of us town meeting members are going to have to take that on, and I am going to be happy to coordinate that. I think. Um, that will mess very nicely with the precinct meetings. I mean, and so um, I, I love my fellow town meeting members, so I look forward to getting in touch with them and, and coordinating that training and setting up a buddy system I mean, so that I mean, those who need a little extra help will have someone that uh, they can turn to for that help. So uh, that's about it. And my only hesitancy about, about doing this sooner early in the agenda was I was a little concerned that the moderator and perhaps maybe Eric might be tuning in late because it was late on the agenda so um if they do turn it turn, turn, turn in late i'll ask the chair if we could maybe consider I mean, talking to them a little bit more but um that's all i have to say thank you sorry i didn't even think to see if the monitor was on the not on the panel okay 
Mr. Carl? No, I'm, I'm very happy to hear this and that we can go forward. Um, so can you review what, what the thinking is around a, a, a workable time, timeline through you, Mr. Chair? Mr. Chaplin? So I, we, we're still thinking that second week of November for the first session. Um, it's, I, you know, it's Len and I, uh, Mr. Diggins and I spoke this morning, and I think we'll have to talk a few more times about exactly what date it will be. Veterans Day, I believe, is on a, is that a Wednesday uh, in the middle of the week. So there's some complications around whether or not we can be ready for the 9th or we have to push a little bit. So we're in that time frame thinking we can get it kicked off by then, but that's what we're, that's what we're shooting for. Okay, and then working backwards, obviously. To yeah, in all yeah, that. yeah. The rest. Okay, great, thank you. And Mr. DeCourcy? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, th thank you, Mr. Chapelain and Mr. Diggins for the uh, for the update. I, I am glad to see that this is moving forward and, and that the discussion with the uh, Lexington Select Board member um, has, has been productive. The only uh, one procedural issue and maybe a question for, for Attorney Heim is just the um, time frame, just procedurally, did, did, does the moderator have to ask us to run the meeting remotely mm -hmm. And then we, we go from there, or do we issue the warrant um, first or announce that the warrant is open first? Because I know there's some different protocols in the, um, in the special legislation. Okay. So um, the special legislation was relative to annual town meetings. I, I think that the right process would be to um, call the special town meeting and then have the moderator uh, make the determination in consultation with public health officials, um, come back to you and say that we think we need to conduct this remotely and make that decision uh, in that order. So I think the first thing would be to sort of set the meeting date. Um, and there's a couple other things that flow from that. So one other thing, if, if, if I may, Mr. Chair, yep. that we just need to be mindful of is, is chapter A, uh, 48 section 5 which basically says that the planning board is going to need to notice each hearing on zoning articles 14 days before that hearing happens so for everything that they have to do we also need to know have a general idea of when the date is with enough time for any zoning articles to be heard and they don't usually hear them in one night so they would need to advertise them for, for two weeks before they could actually have uh, the hearing so um, it may be in everybody's interest uh, once we can get the date down to notice the special town meeting as sort of soon as possible and um, take the steps that you, you uh, express some concern about Mr. DeCourcy as well as give the planning board plenty of time to figure out how they're going to manage um, having zoning article hearings. Thank you. Thank you. And Mrs. Mahan? Um, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, similar to Mr. DeCourcy or one of my other colleagues, um, sort of um, keeping November date in mind and working backwards. Um, is it the moderator or some other office that also needs to sort of give a heads up to um, FinCom, ARB, or Capital Planning in terms of this is the date we're shooting for. It looks like it's in November. Um, these are the articles we already know that we carried over from the uh, annual town meeting we had at the high school field, but also recognizing that once we open the warrant, um, even if it's a shorter time period and 100 registered voters, others may need to come in. So I guess my question would be, um, to you, Mr. Chairman, and anyone you need to direct it to, maybe, I don't know if it's the town manager, um, how are we sort of giving the heads up to um, what is just in the planning process right now, but it looks like maybe in November to FinCom, ARB, and capital planning or any other uh, group that needs to ha have warrant article hearings for this special town meeting? Attorney Heim? Or Mr. Chaplain? So I, that's a very good question. So the, the ARB through 
uh, Ms. Rates' participation in some of these conversations is aware. Uh, I've had informal conversations with the leadership of FinCom and Capital Planning. I think they have a loose sense of what we're looking at, but as we firm things up, we need to firm things up with them. Um, so yes, now, now you're, you're right on that. As soon as, as our schedule gets firmed up, I'll be communicating with them to make sure that they can line up their hearings accordingly. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Town Manager. Appreciate that. So I'm not going to worry about it. It's on our chairman and our town manager. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, and I have had discussions on this with town manager Ms. Diggins the past couple of weeks as we've they've you know been in touch with people in Lexington, and I think. This is certainly, it is going to be difficult for sure. And there'll be a learning curve and, you know, but it's also something that we can handle. And uh, just for anyone that might think why we can't jump right on this as far as training is that, you know, for those who have kids in school know that a lot of the town's technical staff is going to be committed to trying to get our, our kids back in school and get set up. So, you know, we're working with both that and to try to develop the framework for the special town meeting. So we will, uh, we'll get through it, but it will take a lot of work. So we'll ask for patience. Um, so it doesn't look like we need to vote to set a date tonight. Um, would you anticipate by the next meeting that we'd be able to do so? Yes, I, I think to meet all these timelines, we'll have to do so. Yep, okay. All right, so I don't think we, are looking for any motions or votes on this particular article and uh, we will push on. So the next agenda item that we have here is agenda item number six, discussion and approval of Blue Bike Station locations. We have Jenny Ray, Director of Planning and Community Development and Dan, Dan Ansitz, our Senior Transportation Planner is Dan with us. So I, I think you, 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 you've just got me tonight for this one. Uh, right. I, I, so if, if you uh, don't mind, I'll bring the uh, I'll bring the memo that Dan provided to the board up on the screen. Um, okay. So as the board will recall, uh, it adopted or approved four uh, station locations at its last meeting, uh, and there were two uh, potential or uh, yeah potential sites that Dan described to the board, one at the intersection of Linwood Street and the Minuteman Bikeway, and one somewhere in proximity to Thorndike Field, Dog Park, Alewife, Magnolia Field, that general area. So after uh, doing a little more work with both DPW and the folks from Motivate that operates Blue Bikes, uh, Dan has come back to recommend uh, specific locations in those two areas. The first one you can see on the memo that's up on the screen on Linwood. I guess that would be on the Easterly side of um, of the road, adjacent to the near uh, nearby cul-de-sac, and so that I believe that that would be south of the bikeway itself, uh, taking up three parking spaces, uh, good access to the bike path, good access to Spy Pond Park, uh, with one drawback being that because it's on the roadway, it's it's likely that we will have to take it up uh, for the winter season. But this is this is the the workable recommendation that uh, Dan has made for this particular location. Would you like me to pause at this and try to answer any questions or go on to the next one and then take it? I'll go on to the next one. I think we can handle the questions in this session. So the next one uh, is down uh, sort of between Thorndike Field and Magnolia Field. Uh, it's not quite as close to the dog park as Mr. Amstutz has origi had originally hoped. Part of the challenge was we would have needed an easement from the MBTA to put it in the location we had originally thought about and we couldn't get a clear timeline on how long getting such an easement uh, or even an allowance or MOA would take. Uh, so we located um, an area that's already on existing town property. So you can, I think you can see on this map. So this is, this is where the, the bikeway uh, takes that bend there and we've probably all walked on this sort of crisscrossing dirt path, depending on where we're going. So this is town property over here. This is the, the path that wraps around Magnolia Field and you can walk over to Magnolia Park. So we'd be talking about putting our own concrete pad in here, so DPW would do that work, and placing uh, the bike station right here on our property. No need to get MBTA approval and we, we would have site control over it. And we wouldn't have to remove it in, uh, in the winter. 
And I think that's. I think all right. that's all. Turn to the board for questions or motions, Mr. Carl. Yeah. First, first, I'll uh, move approval. Um, I just had one quick question on the um, the Thorndike Magnolia one. I'm trying to recall, and I can't tell from the picture there is the new station directly adjacent to um, some enclosed utility um, controllers or, or transformers. Yeah, fenced you know, in, fenced in. I I think I, if you could, can you see my my cursor? Yes. I think that's down just off the screen over here. Okay. Okay. That's my it, recollection. I, I was trying to recall and uh, I wasn't able to go down there and it's not really material anyways. It's just, I, I'm just anticipating that, that where this is an informal path that is built up that you're probably going to see, you know, a new little jog around the, um, uh, around the stations. Just yeah, I, I think you, I, I think you are right about that. Yeah. Yeah. So great. I, I appreciate the creative thinking here, though, and I think, I think it's a good location. I think I think it's great to have it even a little bit closer to uh, Magnolia and Thorndike. Close to the neighborhood too. That the access to Barnum is right up over and you know just just outside the top of the screen as well. So yeah, good, good access. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh -huh. Um. I'm unmuted. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'll second the motion and I just have, I think, a couple of comments. Um, first, am I correct that uh, the other four blue bike stations are mostly from the center to East Arlington? Correct. Um, my, my second question would be through the chair, Mr. Hurd, would be um, if we approve uh, these additional two locations at Linwood Street at the Minuteman Bikeway and Minuteman Bikeway at Thorndike Field, um, does that preclude if we find a, uh, a bikeway location in the Heights, whether it's the industrial zone, Myrac, Sims, or other, we would not be able to add that? Is it the way the contract is written out once we've agreed to six locations, if we do find a seventh location in the Heights, which I heard a lot of people, I think Mr. DeCourcy might have mentioned this and others, um, is that sort of shutting the door on that? I, I guess I wouldn't describe it as shutting the door. Um, the rule that Motivate likes to try to adhere to, I believe, was having stations be within a third of a mile of the closest station. So the closest station to the Heights right now would be in the center, um, uh, just behind uh, the Uncle Sam Plaza. So we could, I think we can look at from there, I, I would imagine from there on out, we would probably space things a third of a mile away, either on Mass Ave or along the bikeway heading west. Um, I mean, I think all along what, you know, to adhere with motivates rules for operating, I think we wanna prove success with this system as it's currently laid out. And then if success is there and funding is there, see if we can start to move west. So I, I, don't, I don't think it precludes it. Um, I, I mean, I, I can't see how it would preclude it would be my answer. Okay, um, I, I guess I would leave with the chair and the town manager. Um, we're definitely covered in East Arlington in the center. We don't really see it in the Heights. Um, if the chair and the town manager could further investigate, I know our um, approved contract identified six locations. We're now at six. Uh, whatever we can do if we find a seventh or eighth in the Heights to make sure that that's something doable or we're not locked out of it. So I'll leave that to, to the chair and the town manager if, if you both are comfortable with that. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And I would definitely like to investigate further locations I think um, and I would love to have it in the heights because that's where I am but in our discussion at our last meeting one of the main deterrents was that if you have one that's more than a third of a mile from the other locations and if you popped on in the heights and you rode up to the heights and then it was full then you'd be riding back to the center and then taking the bus back up to the heights because it's, that's why they have them so close together but you know, I think the idea here would be to 
make a successful program and just start to push them one by one out, out towards the other parts of Arlington. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and so, Mr. Diggins? Yes. Uh, 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 you're, you're muted, Mr. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I figured it out before you said anything, but it's just having problems hitting the button. Uh, thank you, though. Um, so I'll pick up a little bit where my colleague, um, Ms. Mahan, left off me. So, so um, yeah, my understanding, too, was, was, was intriguing at the last meeting was when uh, Mr. Hanson mentioned that uh, I think there was uh, another application for a grant and, uh, that might come through in 20. 122 that uh, would give us the ability to put more stations um, out maybe and I think it was maybe for 80k uh, so maybe we could even get another six stations and so that's why I was really interested in having them strung along Mass Ave so that we could reach the heights following that one third of mile um, distance rule uh, but I asked the last meeting you know why there was a potential location I mean, on Broadway Street. And the answer was that uh, it was I mean, uh, partly an equity issue, which I understood. Um, I'm interested in, in why now we have these stations on the bike path. And I'll just say a little more, because when I think about um, where these stations go, I think, why would anyone get a bike there and leave a bike in? or leave a bike there. I kind of get it along Mass Ave. I don't so much get it along the bike pass. Uh, now, all of this, I mean, I'm gonna prove it enthusiastically, but I just have to ask this question for my own um, um, edification. So if you have some sense of the rationale for the, the stations on the bike pass, I'd appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when we set up Line Bike, I received a lot of feedback in this regard and I know when talking about blue bike the same, and I'll even speak for myself as a user of, of line bike owners here. People don't always commute the same way or in the same manner. I, I've heard from a number of people who, in expressing interest for bike share, are the type of people who might jump on the bus to get in the work in the morning, but in the afternoon would love to be able to jump on a bike and don't wanna to have to bring that bike on the bus and on the train with them into the city. Um, so I think right, right out of the gate, I think that's number one, right? Um, you know, you, you, may, you might take the bus in, but then you come home, you get off at Alewife. I don't know if is Mr. Kiro saying he's one of those people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, that, you know, and, I'd, like so, to speak, I'd like to speak to it if I could too. Yeah. So you, yeah, you, get, you, you know, you might get off the train and say, no, you know, now I'm going to take my, I'm going to jump on a bike and take it, take it home. So, you know, maybe you live over near Broadway, maybe you live off Capitol Square, maybe you live in the center, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so you pick up a bike down here and head up, head up to where you go. Um, I, I also think it, it's a recreational corridor. Um, we see, I see people with blue bikes coming presumably from Cambridge and Somerville on the bike path quite often. So I, I think it's a recreational corridor where people coming, you know, any, any which way might uh, choose to access that bike to get where they're going faster um, if they know that it's there. Mr. Carroll, thank you. you want yeah, th thank you. No, I just wanted to just add a use case because before the pandemic had me working from home every day, I was walking um, from my home along the bike bike path to um, Alewife and back uh, just about every day. But but um, the use case for me along the, the bike path was um, if, for example, I had gotten a late start in the morning, I might have been walking part of the way, but I knew I wasn't going to make my com commuter bus. I might, I, if there was a line bike in the days of line bikes, I'd grab one and, and kind of finish out the route that way. And, and likewise going the other way, sometimes if I, if I was taking a class at the high school or something was running late, I, I'd pick it up along the way. So I was actually partly walking and partly taking the bike. I think that these locations that we're, um, um, we're approving tonight, I think they make a lot of, a lot of sense though, because they're, you know, they're, they're near uh, some of our very active um, sports fields and, you know, recreation areas. So uh, I, I do see that there, there'll be a lot of uh, destination traffic as well there. So um, well, I, I think it's pretty sound. Okay. I appreciate the explanation. Then one, one, one last question, and that is, um, are, are we locked down to these locations? You know, are we able to move them if for whatever reason we decide we want to put them someplace else? You know, I would have to double check that. Um, I would imagine they would want them to be there for some period of time to 
establish the network connectivity, so to speak. But I would also guess that within reason, we would be able to move them around, but, but I would have to review the contract. I, I see town council's raising his hand. He might know, he might know for sure from his contract review. Mm -hmm. So th th there is a process for us to uh, reevaluate the stations and the length of the contract also um, will provide some natural moment for both um, Blue Bikes and the town to assess. I believe, if I remember correctly, they, they had talked about moving the stations um, the last time they were on, or maybe it was the first time they were on. But So it is possible. Um, I just think there'd have to be a joint agreement on, you know, where we're moving the stations and why. Thank you. That's it for me. Yeah. Mr. DeCorsi? Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I appreciate the, the memorandum. One thing I, I like about the discussion here is um, Mr. Amstutz mentioned both on street and off street locations. And if we are going to add more locations in the future, it, it, to me, it's preferable to have the, the docking stations off street so you're not losing parking, you're not affecting traffic. But for Linwood Street, for example, the, the, he discussed why it wasn't practical to um, keep it off street and appreciate that. And I think, you know, in the last discussion on whether we move stations, I mean, one, one thing we're going to have to look at, we have to hit a certain number of rides for, in order for the contract to be renewed or, or a certain level of usage. And I think as we go forward here, if we find that there are some locations that aren't used as much, that would be the time to go back to Blue Bikes and, and seek a waiver of that one third of a mile and, and see if we can find another location to, to um, pick the numbers up. Yeah, I agree. I think these are good locations. I would have liked to explore putting it off street at Linwood, but I understand that it just, I mean, logistically wouldn't have worked. Um, but I think that, that's a good location because I do anticipate there'll be a lot of people just from the commuter standpoint that from East Arlington that would want a, a little walk in the morning and get on a bike to get into Elwhite. And, and that's a good location for that. So I do agree with these locations. So we have a motion to approve from Mr. Caro, second by Ms. Mahan. Attorney Hein. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Curo. Yes. Mr. Hurt. Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. And that brings us to item number seven. Presentation Arlington Community Electricity Op Up Campaign. Ken Pruitt, our energy manager. Is Mr. Pruitt with us? Yes, he is. I've just promoted Ken, Jill, and Patrick Roche, uh, who I believe I believe all three of you are gonna speak. Ken, is that is that right? That's true, in sequence. Okay. Look at that. <laughs> right, I will recognize Mr. Pruitt. Great. Thanks so thanks so much to Mr. Chair and uh, to the to the members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, again, my name is Ken Pruitt. I'm the Energy and Project Manager for the Town of Arlington, um, working out of the Department of Planning and Community Development. And um, we're here to to talk about really an exciting uh, partnership program um, uh, between the Town of Arlington. Uh, between uh, along with Good Energy, which is our uh, green electricity aggregation broker, and the Arlington chapter uh, of Mothers Out Front, um, to uh, to rebrand um, the Community Choice Electricity Program, um, uh, as well as uh, to uh, create a new, um, more effective, and user friendly website um, and other uh, other materials. Uh, and also to run uh, an opt-up campaign, a multifaceted opt-up campaign that we hope will get um, many more uh, electricity customers in Arlington to add, uh, voluntarily add new renewable electricity to, um, to their supply, whether that be 50% or 100%. And uh, it, it is an exciting program. And I wanna, um, I wanna thank, uh, before going any further, 
um, good energy um, for uh, uh, offering to uh, help us um, conceive of and launch uh, this campaign at no cost to the town. Um, the, the, their work with graphics on the logos, um, their help with the language um, around the different product offerings um, and the website uh, and other materials that will come out over time, they're developing on their own dime, um, and we're uh, I'm happy to uh, happy to have them do that. Um, in addition to that, um, the Arlington chapter of Mothers Out Front has offered to do uh, a great deal of of work promoting uh, the opt up campaign to uh, to the residents from through their their membership, um, and we appreciate that as well. Um, and so um, we can. Am I in control of this, or Adam? If, Adam, are you in control of the? Um, yeah, I, I, I can advance them as you as you tell me to. Great, thank you. Uh, maybe if you could go to the next slide. So I just want to uh, introduce my co-presenters, um, Patrick Roach, who's the director of innovation at Good Energy, um, and Jill Monka, um, who I mentioned is a volunteer with Arlington Mothers Out Front, um, and who's been critical in this in this campaign. But I also um, finally want to thank um, both Adam Chapdelaine and Joan Roman uh, for all the time they've put into helping to plan um, this opt-up campaign and rebranding effort. They've spent a lot of time looking um, you know, at different drafts uh, of campaign materials and the website. And so we think what we have to show you um, here tonight um, is pretty exciting. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Patrick Roach from Good Energy to uh, cover the next uh, several slides. All right, great. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, thanks uh, for having me. So I thought we'd start off just by talking about what this program is. So it is called Municipal Aggregation, or sometimes Community Choice Aggregation. And just as a refresher, uh, your electricity bill has two parts. It has a supply portion, which is the sources of electricity, where the electricity comes from. And then it has the distribution, the wires and the poles that get it to you. And so in Arlington, Eversource will always handle the wires and the poles, but you can choose uh, where your electricity comes from. And Arlington has chosen to do a community choice aggregation program uh, where the town selects a supply source and uh, Eversource still bills uh, everyone. You get a single bill and they still you know, handle the, the uh, power outages and, and uh, all that all that sort of stuff. So um, this program has been active since August of 2017 and it was uh, launched under the name Arlington Community Choice Aggregation or, or Arlington CCA and there were sort of uh, four main goals of the program. So one of the big uh, efforts have, has been to increase the amount of renewable energy that is used going above and beyond state standards but at the same time, trying to have competitive prices compared to Eversource um, and hopefully some savings. Also price stability. So the program can contract for longer, longer terms than Eversource can, so have stable prices. And uh, also choice. So the program has multiple options and those options really differ in the amount of extra uh, renewable energy that they have. And so, the, the program has been, um, was designed to sort of achieve those. And Adam, if you scroll down to the next slide, uh, the program accomplishment slide here. So uh, over the past uh, almost three years at this point, as yeah, here we are in August, 2020, uh, participation is around 14,000 households and 1,000 businesses. So, and I think in Arlington, there might be around eight, 18,000 households total. So the, the vast majority of, of, uh, of the residents are, are in the program and that's what it's really designed for. So the program has generated uh, a good deal of savings. So there's been a cumulative $2.6 million saved compared to the Eversource rates, the Eversource supply rates. And we just note that savings can't be guaranteed in the future. We don't know what Eversource's rates will be each six, every six months they change. But um, we've delivered that over the course of the contract, and that works out to about $165 per household with the uh, average electricity use in the program. So uh, that's on the savings front. On the renewables front, 
the program initially started with uh, in the standard product, the one that most uh, people are enrolled in, that had 5% additional renewable energy. And uh, after the first two and a half years, that was the first contract, the, the town started its second contract at the end of 2019 and went up to 11% uh, additional renewable energy. So more than doubled that. And that all comes from within New England, it's known as mass class one. And while you know 11% might not sound like a massive number, in context, the state minimum in 2020 is 16%. So you're not quite doubling the state amount, but you're going well above and beyond. And so that's, that's really powerful um, when, when we look at every person uh, in the program, more or less, is, is getting uh, this extra renewable energy. So uh, collectively across the entire town, it adds up to a lot of extra renewable energy purchased. So uh, that's about 12,000 megawatt hours of additional renewable energy above and beyond the state standards. And to put that in perspective, that's a, enough to power completely around uh, 2,200 Arlington homes with all with clean energy. So that's a lot of extra clean energy being purchased. And Arlington is following a very similar strategy to a number of other neighboring communities. So you're all sort of pursuing this strategy of, of going above and beyond the state standards. And that's helping to support the growth of renewable energy in the region, which is really important. So you can go to the next slide, please. So uh, looking a little bit more into the renewable energy side of things. We have the standard product, which has the 11% extra renewable energy. And then there are also, there's a product with 50% um, extra renewable energy and then a 100% renewable energy. So if those are the people who really want to go above and beyond and um, can usually afford to pay a little bit more per month and get that extra renewable energy. So uh, as of July, we have about 731 uh, households that are, are in that in one of those two options, and most are in the 100% option. That's, you see about 589 um, accounts there. And the, the, the pie charts, what they show is on the left, you can see that the, the, the people who have opted up, as we say, who are in the 50% and the 100%, they're only about 5% of the total accounts. It's a very small little chunk there. But on the right, you can see that when we look at the total purchases of extra renewable energy, they're um, almost a third across the entire town. So they have a really outsized impact and on, on the renewable energy goals of the program. So that was sort of the genesis for us uh, working with Ken to think, you know, how can we uh, over the next few years really increase the number of, of people uh, who are in these 50 and 100% products to really help the program achieve its renewable energy goals even more. And to do that, we thought, you know, I think we need to revisit the, the sort of the messaging and the branding of the program. So if you want to go to the next slide. The, the program you know, was called Arlington CCA. And I think what we realized was that to the average person that, that didn't mean all that much. Uh, and what we decided to do is went through a process of saying, okay, how can we, what we want to communicate to people is that this is a town program, very different from, it's not, you know, people who knock on your doors or, or, or you know, call you on the phone, trying to recruit you into some program. A lot of people to know this is a town-backed uh, program and that it's about electricity. Uh, so so uh, we came up with the name Arlington Community Electricity, which uh, we think kind of achieves those goals well and happens to have a nice acronym base. And uh, we came up with this logo. <laughs> so we have the, the town seal and then we have the, the program logo here. And you know, before we didn't really have any logo to speak of. Um, so now what we, we have this that can go on all the materials to have a consistent branding and, and color scheme. And um, what we decided for now is to always have the, the town seal along with the program seal. So it's again clearly communicating that it's a town program. Uh, so that's, yeah, so the, the uh, rebranding the name and, and coming up with the logo is a, was a big first step. And then if you go to the next slide, Uh, these are also the, the product names. So there are there are four choices in the um, Arlington Community Electricity Program. There's our standard product on the far left, and that's called Local Green. That's what it was called before. And it has that extra 11% renewable energy. Um, 
And uh, there's the, as you go to the right, there's the 50% product and the 100% product. Their names changed. Um, they were just a little, a little wonky. So we have local green, then local greener, and local greenest. So it's just sort of on a continuum. Um, from, yeah, so the idea is that the thing that's changing between the products is the amount of renewable energy. So that's what we're trying to convey. Uh, and then just as a reminder, we also have the basic option all the way on the right. That just meets the state's minimum standards for renewable energy. So that, that's there for people too. So if you go to the next slide, uh, one of the big things we've done once we sort of worked on the messaging and branding was to uh, revamp the website. So what we wanted to do was uh, help the website really support uh, the, the, um, the, the goal of getting people to opt up to really to facilitate that, but also to have a lot more information about the impact the program's having, where your renewable energy is coming from, and, and also um, just make it more educational in general. So when someone, if someone does see information about the program and they go to the website, it just really breaks it down for them about what this is because uh, you know electricity is something not a lot of us think about and, and certainly our bill and so we've got sample bills up there and uh, just a lot of other information and people can do take all the actions that they might want in the program on the website in between whether it's changing their product choice whether it's leaving the program or or joining the program so this will be um, in just a few days, I think what we're going to be doing is it's a website that, that Good Energy builds and maintains. So, so we, we, we work with the town to get all the content uh, approved, but we maintain it, but we're going to be linking it to the uh, ArlingtonMA.gov uh, web address so that it will have that .gov um, ending, which again connects it to the municipality. So it will be ace or ace.arlingtonma.gov. Which, which will, will be really nice for that. Um, and we'll, we'll invite you to explore it. We'll probably, probably be up in a few days. So uh, the next slide is what we're uh, really looking forward to doing is kicking off a, an opt-up campaign, as we call it. And what we're really doing with, with Ken and, and with Jill is kind of designing a, um, a year-long outlook of different ways that we can um, Get, get the program uh, into sort of the mainstream uh, and, and promote awareness of it and also promoting the ability you know, to opt up into local, uh, local greener or, or greenest. And you know, we have about 730 participants in those opt up categories right now and uh, the town set a goal of uh, hitting 1,000 by the end of the year. So we'll, we'll see if we can do it. And, and these are, it's really gonna involve a lot of different things. So, we're going to be doing a lot with social media to, to reach people and um, promote that and promote awareness. We'll also be doing things like um, traditional media letters to the editor. Uh, we'll be printing a bunch of lawn signs soon, which, which people can, can put up and hopefully we'll be seeing around town. Um, other signage, maybe some banners we'll be looking at, and uh, just a lot of different kind of diverse, diverse media. So there'll be a lot, I think, coming um, and we're really excited about the partnership with Mothers Out Front, who will be really, I think, impactful in, in helping us achieve those goals. Uh, so I think I'll give it back to Ken right now. Thanks, Patrick. And uh, Mr. Chair, with your permission, I think there's, we have one more speaker, uh, Jill Manka from Mothers Out Front, um, if you are- Absolutely. Great. Jill, are you there? I'm here. Uh, Good evening, I'm Jill Manka, Arlington Mothers Out Front Local Campaigns Liaison. And um, on behalf of Mothers Out Front, I would like to say that the ACE rebranding and website is a huge improvement. It makes the community elect electricity program easy to understand and answers questions very well. Arlington Mothers Out Front has been working to persuade residents to opt up to 100% renewable le electricity through Arlington's CCA program since its kickoff in, 19, in 2017. Having the town initiate and support a new opt-up effort will help convince even more residents to opt up through the ACE program and Mothers Out Front will continue to support this effort. Choosing 100% electricity through ACE while very effective is only the first step in fighting climate change. In, ta in tandem with this, with this we will need to switch the source from fossil fuels to renewables for both heating and transportation. 
switching the source is especially important and urgent in light of the new Massachusetts legislation passed by both chambers to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. The 2050 roadmap includes measurable steps along the way, a 50% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and at least a 75% decrease by 2040. Arlington Mothers Out Front is in full support of the ACE program and renewing this opt-up effort. We should not underestimate the importance of this work in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and advocating for the transition that we desperately need to reach net zero in order to address climate change. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And Mr. Pruitt, did you have any other, anything to add before I turn to the board for questions or comments? Uh, no, that's, to, that's the end of our uh, collective presentation. Thanks again for making time on your agenda uh, for us tonight. Happy to answer your questions. Thank you. All right, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I'd like to make a motion and then uh, a question. Uh, first, I'd like to move a seat of the presentation and approve the proposed Arlington Community Electricity Opt-Up Campaign. Um, and then my question would be, um, I don't know, it's to Mr. Pruitt or anyone else through the chair. Um, I heard um, in the discussion or presentation that um, there would be, I'm asking, am I correct that my recollection is that there will be a link from the Arlington Mass Town website to the Arlington Electricity Opt Up Program. So, in, in, my, in my question is, so many people go to the website and you can kind of go look for one answer and find it three different places. So w will there be a link when people go into Arlington Utilities, it gets them to this electricity op-up campaign? Right. Mr. Pruitt? Yeah, there, there will be, and uh, we're still discussing the, you know, the best, um, most logical, straightforward uh, way to promote that. Um, on the website, but the, the goal as you espouse is, is our goal as well. We want to make this as, as easy as possible um, for people to opt up. And uh, we think that the website that uh, Good Energy has helped us um, to build is tremendously user-friendly. So the last thing we would want is for people to have a hard time getting there. Um, so um, we're, we're going to do our best to, to, uh, to, to, to make it as accessible as possible. And, and um, Jill Manka from uh, Mothers Out Front has actually been very helpful in sort of bringing together a group of her members to, to kind of reality check uh, different pieces of this, including the website, to make sure they found it intuitive. And we'll, we'll do the same thing with the, with the link from arlingtonma.gov. Okay, and if I could, Mr. Chair, um, I do want to thank Ken and, and others. Um, I do know when people were sending me inquiries I think within the past month about what are my utilities, what are my choices, and other people directed them to Eversource, which is a great company also. Um, but it was noted that when it went to the, I may say this wrong, uh, what utilities cover Arlington feature on the ArlingtonMA.gov, it didn't get us to um, the community electricity program. So I'm going to leave it to you and, and Jill and others to uh, make sure there's also a tie-in link to that. I did, um, when I got that inquiry, um, forward it to, to Ken, Mr. Pruitt, who answered right away on the Arlington list and others. But I want to make sure that um, when we have that main Arlington MA.gov page and we get to that page, and I don't know what the title is that gets us there, that says utilities that mm -hmm. under every source is also the section option, se second option. And I don't know how you do that. So I'm gonna leave it to you all. And thank you for listening to me. Great, we'll absolutely look into that. Thank you. All right, Mr. Diggins. I enthusiastically second this. And I just have um, a few questions uh, uh, and um, they're kind of light. Uh, uh, well, first, uh, um, 
Well, actually, the first two things are, are more comments and a little more weighty. Um, first, I want to say that, that um, this is going to be an interesting time to launch a campaign uh, for something like this. You know? And so uh, be patient you know, with judging your um, success, because I think a lot of people are just going to be tapped um, um, when it comes to um, extra funds to, um, to, to spend on things. People are very uncertain, I think. And so there are those of us who would love to do this, but maybe just don't feel that uh, we can spare the box, even though we really want to save the planet. We just um, just trying to survive. So just give yourself some, some time on it. Um, the second, in terms of um, outreach, I mean, there is um, Sustainable Arlington, which is under the umbrella of um, Envision Arlington. I know that they would be all over this in terms of helping you to get the word out. Uh, so you probably thought of them already. If you didn't, you're going to think of them tomorrow. So I just mention it now. Um, the third uh, is um, <laughs> I'm going to play like I'm a marketer now. And I think the, the ace idea is a really good one. Uh, I, I understand the green, greener, greenest, but you can play around with the ace theme. It's like you have three aces, three of a kind. You can get a pair in there. You get like a full house. Just toss that out there. Uh, and um, who designed the logo? Through the chair. Through, everything's through the chair. Who designed the logo? Of course. Of course. Huh? Yeah, it, primarily, primarily good energy um, with some input from Jill, who herself is a, a very skilled uh, graphic artist. Um, you know, and Adam and Joan and, and myself and others. Yeah, well, I, I like the plug going through the E. I like that a lot. That's very clever. Uh, I will say, though, I mean, losing the leg on the A, it just kind of, I mean, I, it just, you know, so I don't know. I was just kind of wondering if there's any discussion about it. It's fine. It's not a deal breaker or anything, but uh, so I just tossed it out there uh, humorously. So great job. I mean, I wish you all the success. Thank you. All right, Mr. DeCorsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for the uh, the presentation. Just a, a question on the participation. You mentioned that you have 14,000 households and 1,000 businesses. How does that compare to a, a year ago? I don't know if, it, if the, the level of participation um, has been growing steadily or if it's been flat. Maybe if we could turn that over to, to Mr. Chair, if we could turn that over to Patrick Roach. Yeah, yeah sure. The uh, nice, Patrick. Yeah, the level of participation has been uh, very steady. So it's been uh, about, you know, total about 15,000 at total. Um, sometimes it's been up just about 16,000. But generally what happens is um, as, as people move, move out or even move within town, they still, you know, accounts change, so they'll, they'll drop out and we do these periodic sweeps to, um, to enroll new uh, people who moved in or changed account numbers. So the numbers stay pretty, pretty flat. Um, Right around there. Okay, and, and I, I know you have the goal to get up to a thousand for the greener and the greenest programs. Is it a goal to increase that fourteen thousand to a to a higher number, or, or is that a, a comfortable number? It's just getting people to shift from um, that the, the lower percentage uh, up higher. You know, I think we certainly want to make make people aware that they have this option to join the program and make it very easy for them. And I think the, the website will do that and, and the messaging we do will reinforce that. The people who aren't on the program might be with a competitive supplier already. Um, so they might be with their own third party supplier or they might be, um, that, that's most of who the, the, those, that those other uh, say three or 4,000 are. Um, so they've made a choice that they want to be in the competitive market kind of on their own. So it's, it's not super likely we'll get a lot of them, but we will, um, I think, you know, make sure it's very easy if they do want to get in. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Mr. Carl. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And thank you to all the presenters. I'm a huge fan of this program. I'm, I'm on the local greenest 100%, although in, um, you know, Full disclosure, I have rooftop solar, so I use it for my overage um, 100%, but I was uh, very enthusiastic about um, signing up early on. Um, love the new logo. I love the, the rebranding. I agree. It'll be a lot uh, easier to communicate to folks. Um, and I love the new, you know, the new names, local green, local green, or local greenest. I think it'll be a lot easier to um, <clears throat> communicate. I have to admit that I get a little hung up though uh, with the uh, on slide seven with the um, uh, well they're not really pie charts but the uh, the graphs and the the uh, captions there um, 
because, uh, you know, we say at the bottom, it's 11% extra renewable, 50% extra renewable, although if, I, my, if I'm understanding correctly, that's not actually extra renewable. It's actually, it's a 50% renewable energy is, is part of that program. Likewise with 100%, it's 100% extra. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, with the, as far as the graphics are concerned, we're, we're <clears throat> I think implying to someone who, who reads this casually that, that um, they only have 11% local renewable and the local green, but they actually have 27% and likewise with the basic, it's 11. So it, it seems, it feels to me like the, the way this is being communicated here, we're kind of comparing apples and, and oranges a little bit. We're on a different, um, communicating different pieces of information for the different plans. And I, I, it feels to me like one of those things that was very possibly um, a matter for a lot of discussion when it was being designed, but uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's been any thought uh, to that, because I could see that being a little confusing to, uh, to, to folks. Mr. Pruitt? Yeah, that, um, you know, Mr. Curro, thanks for, for bringing that point up. That, that's something that we frankly struggled with a little bit as we were, you know, designing, um, designing these logos, um, you know, and so Strictly speaking, you know, the, if you read the language underneath, um, it's correct because it's extra renewable. But as uh, your, your point um, was a sticking point for us as well, you know, you, you're when if you're in local green, you're you're, you're actually receiving, you know, um, not 11 percent, um, but 27 percent um, renewable electricity. Same thing if basic is actually 16 percent. Um, the local green is, is actually 116%, just to make things even more complex. Um, so it, it, um, uh, so it, it, it is a complex, um, uh, it's a little bit of a complex issue. We, we ultimately decided, I don't know if we can get the, um, there we go. Uh, we ultimately decided um, to present it the way we're presenting it here, you know, internally with our discussions and in the, in the materials thus far, but, you know, we, we, we certainly want to get this right. That's one of the reasons that we uh, asked for a little bit of time to present to, to this board tonight. Um, and we could certainly revisit the way we portray, um, portray these. I, I guess one thing I might do is with your, with your leave, um, I know that uh, Good Energy has dealt with this same question with um, the branding campaigns in, in other communities. Uh, uh, that also have electricity aggregation. So perhaps, um, perhaps uh, Patrick might want, you know, might be able to, to uh, you know, give some some comments on what other communities have done with that same question because it's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rudge. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I am, I'm glad you brought that up. And, and to to, um, to to Ken's point, say the the hundred percent. It is we, we do take. Uh, 100% of your, your usage, your kilowatt hours, and purchase uh, renewable energy credits to match that uh, on top of <clears throat> what is being purchased in the state minimum. So it is it is 100% uh, extra. Um, what to, I think what, um, one of the reasons that some other, other communities have kind of taken a similar approach to, to sort of highlighting the extra, uh, partly because their, their emphasis is on showing the the additional impact that they're having above and beyond the state standards. Um, so that is, it is geared to that. But the other, and the other piece is that um, in talking about total renewable energy, uh, what, one part is that the, the, the percentages go up every year. So that number would kind of, it kind of like would, would, would keep, keep creeping up. And then there are also a bunch of different types of renewable energy or classifications. So we could, um, the mass class one classification, which is sort of New England and new, uh, that's 16%, but there's also a, a class two, there's a waste to energy, there, um, so there are a few different things. So I think in recognizing that, what you'll see on, on the site is um, there's a, a page where we have more detailed information about, about all of the rates, 
and we, uh, for each one, we list the, the, the total. So we take whatever the extra is and the base. So there's a total percentage that's, that's listed there. And then there's also a uh, PDF that we link to with detail about all those other um, classifications. So I think that's a big improvement, uh, particularly upon the, the, the previous site. Um, so I think we should, there'll be a lot more information for the people who want to find out yeah, more about that. Yeah, I, pre I appreciate that explana explanation. I'm not too proud to say that I think um, in encountering this confusion, it actually uncovered some confusion I had about these um, two higher tiers as well. Um, as to whether they, they constituted j just an absolute 50% and 100% as opposed to an additional on top of the, uh, the statutory requirement. Thank you. It's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And just to reiterate what my colleagues have said, this is such an amazing program. And we talk about this on a yearly basis, but it's, it, does not, it is something that we need to keep talking about and to have this campaign to get it out in front of residents, I think will be really effective because this is certainly a location where residents will be receptive to this. So I'm excited to see the next year's results and next year's numbers. Um, so with that, we have a motion to receive from Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Heim. This is Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Curo. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. All right, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you. So that takes us to item number eight on the agenda. For approval, letter of support to Mass Housing regarding 1165R Massachusetts Avenue. Um, do we have, Ms. Chaplain, is there anyone from the proponent that's with us? There is, and I, I also just accidentally de demoted Joe, uh, select, select board member Curro to attendees. So let, me, let me fix that. Um, uh, yeah, there, there's several members. Would you like me to promote uh, Attorney O'Connor, uh, Julia Myrak, and Daniel St. Clair? Is it that? Yes. Okay. And Joe. Joe. Sorry, sorry about that, Mr. Kiro. <laughs> the, the, I, I, I can sometimes click on somebody and the names jump around, so that it was, it was not intentional, I swear. Attorney Heim, do we have to have the minutes reflect that the town manager just kicked Mr. Caro out of the meeting? Briefly, I'm going to play the fifth one. Um, we, we, I'm going to insist have, on it. We have a raised hand, Mr. Chair, from um, a phone number attendee. I I'm not sh I don't know if the project team. Maybe that's could that be Mary? Um, sure, you can. Does, Mary, does Mary's number end in nine six uh, nine six seven? Does that ring a bell to you, Julia? Adam, I'm on. Okay, you're here. Here here. Okay. Uh, sound. Okay, great. Okay. All right, we have uh, attached to the, the meeting here a revised letter um, based on some discussions we've had with both proponents um, and, you know, with some more information that we've gotten. What I am proposing is we've taken the letter that was presented to us at the last meeting, we have in fact changed it to a letter of support and uh, changed the language a little bit. So I will go to Ms. Attorney Winstanley O'Connor. Is there anything that you want to add before I go to the, the board for? If I could, Mr. Mr. Yep. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Town Manager, I just wanted to um, say to the Board of Selectmen that I apologize if you thought my two letters were aggressive um, I was just trying to uh, get, be very direct with the factual information. I guess that's the litigator in me. Um, but uh, we appreciate, you know, it was important to the Myrak family to have a support letter from the Board of Selectmen uh, because they were really not particularly interested in proceeding with the project if the town was not interested. This has been a, a couple of year journey and um, they took very seriously the directive of the town 
And when they designed this project, they looked at the master plan, they looked at the Millbrook corridor study, they looked at the housing plan, they looked at the smart growth criteria. So um, they wanted to come to this town with a project that they could be proud of and that you people could be proud of as well. So we wanna thank you for um, all of your time that you spent on this and effort. And, um, and I know you've received comments from a number of other people as well. Yep. In, uh... Does Julia or Dan wanna to chime in or um I'll just second what Mary said and say that you know we're we're very grateful for the time that you guys took to um reconsider the letter and to listen to everything that various people had to say and to factor that in and we're very pleased that um we're now offered a letter of support and we hope this is the beginning of a long and, and friendly adventure together to build something really great for the town so thank you great. Uh, mr diggins um i will motion to approve the letter uh and um i just have a uh, a couple of questions maybe just one sure. um so in the in the the letter um from um um the um attorney and, and by the way i mean um yeah, uh, the the tone of the letter is fine. You know, I mean, you, you, you have to defend your ground, and and and, and I appreciate that. So um, I wasn't offended in the least. You know, but um, in talking about the 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 numbers, I mean, um, um, for um, the rental, I um, it, I was just trying to do some math. I mean, so so um, you say that the artists were being charged like seven dollars um per square foot. Seven to fifteen dollars per square foot. It um that's per month. Well, it's you take the number of square feet that they occupy, you multiply multiply by seven or fifteen, whatever the number is, and divide by twelve. That's okay. an annual. That's an annual rate. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. 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 Okay. I, I thought so. So um, I yeah. just needed to clarify that. So I got you. Okay. Fine. Fine. So um, that's it. That's my question. So thank you. Sure. And Mr. Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the proponents. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with, with where we're at um, here. I, I, I feel like what we were, um, what was before us for consideration before was a supportive letter. Uh, I think we've, we've spelled that out in, in uh, more in black and white. Um, I had suggested at the last meeting that we, we do um, actually call out the fact that this has been a cooperative um, process and we, we do that here. Um, and also note, note the uh, proponent's long history of uh, civic and philanthropic engagement with the, with the town. I think that's important to note. Um, we, we still continue to give, we give voice to some of the comments that we received um, uh, from the public, but I think that, that um, you know, the commentary that we, um, we had at, at the time of the, the initial presentation, as well as, um, you know, the, the, um, the bulk of, of, of what our, uh, initial draft had, had included was always supportive of this. Um, I, we've received more public commentary, I think, since our meeting two weeks ago. It's been positive, uh, including from uh, uh, neighbors to the project that I've, I've spoken to. So um, um, I'm, I'm very happy with where we are here um, moving forward. I, I recognize that some of our other boards and commissions um, did submit at the last minute some um, commentary as well. Uh, Mr. Chair, was it your intention to submit those as attachments to, to, to our communication? Or how, how, what was your intention? The, the comments of the boards? Yeah. So we did note in the final letter that we receive additional comments, um, but okay. if, I'd be happy to do so if the boards are inclined. Okay. Yep. So I don't know if Mr. Diggins made a motion I did. At least I thought I did. Oh, did you? Yep. Okay. Yes. So I'll second Mr. Dickens' motion. I'm sorry. No okay. um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy and I look forward to seeing this as it, uh, as it unfolds. All right. Ms. Simhan? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I get you uh, on a motion by Mr. Diggins and Mr. Kuro, which I think I just heard. Um, I went through the chair to Attorney O'Connor or um, Julia Myrak 
um, regarding our comprehensive permit regulations uh, regarding designated 25% of the residential apartments um, to be available for those who make less than 80% of the median outcome, uh, income is that included in this and in this letter? Attorney um, Stanley O'Connor. Um, it's that's part of the program, so um, that would be one of the requirements. Okay, I, I just wanted to highlight. Yeah, that no, 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 absolutely. Watching? That's one of the program requirements. Okay, because uh, we've gotten a lot of it, as uh, I know, Attorney O'Connor has also seen a lot of correspondence around. Um, affordability and, and of the residential apartments in the 80% uh, medium fam family household income. And then the other thing that um, I know myself and my colleagues have gotten um, questions about, which I believe this project satisfies to allow us to send a, a full letter of support, is that this um, is in fact a true mixed use project. And I was wondering if, um, either Attorney O'Connor or, or Julia Myrak could answer or speak to the mixed-use project vis-a-vis -vis, um, work bar or anything else that fulfills that requirement. Well, let me just say it doesn't have to be a mixed-use project, but from, from the Myrak family perspective, um, it will ultimately be a mixed-use project, though there'll be separate lots. The intention is that the Myraks will buy out Spalding and Sly when this is all done. And as you know from the other things they own in town, the legacy, they hold things long term. So the work bar will be there right next door to this um, 40B project. So I would suggest that it, it, it's in the spirit of a mixed use project. I might just add that it actually goes one step further. Uh, the parking for work bar is accommodated and built into uh, the garages underneath the residential building. So they are actually tied together and there will be a legal shared parking agreement. So one relies upon the other to be complete. Okay, and if I could just ask one last question, um, Mr. Chair, yep. um, on the parking, uh, I think it was Mr. St. Clair that um, spoke to that. On the parking in underground, um, where we do about the Mill Brook um, and, and thinking about one or two other projects with underground parking um, ter in terms of any environmental impact or any environmental um, accommodations that you've taken into that or how, how do you see that offsetting or not affecting um, the Millbrook in its, its, its current configuration? Well, um, Com is involved, um, will be, Com the Conservation Commission is involved in reviewing all of this. And uh, we have our, um, we're, we're in front of them on September 3rd. So there'll right. be You'll be dealing with all of that. Okay, I don't know if Mr. St. Clair, anything to add? It's okay if you don't. Sure, I mean, I, I the uh, the proposed building number two, the building right beside the work bar building, currently has subterranean space, um, some of which is used for parking, some of which is just occupied, uh, kind of, you know, unfinished space. Um, the new building that will go in that place um, will have a similar um, space, uh, basement space that will be used for parking. It will actually will be pulled further away from the Millbrook than what exists today. And as Miss um, O'Connor shared, you know, we've got to go through all the uh, very tedious and useful steps with Conservation Commission to work, work through that. Th there will not be a negative impact to the Millbrook. And Daniel, you might want to add that um, the largest parking area is going to be under the newly constructed building in the at the rear of the site, and it is above. It, it's on grade parking. It does not right. go below grade at all. It, so the first level right. is on grade. The second level is a is a level above it, and then the housing is four levels above that. So it does not go below grade at all. Exactly. Okay, um, I would thank everyone and I assume this question and it doesn't need an answer, but I just want to put it out there. Um, this question or this query is probably more appropriate appropriate for the Conservation Commission um, with the Millbrook uh, going through part of this project. Um, any remediation or 
accommodation for a, a, a large surge, whether they call it a hundred year storm, and sometimes we get it every 10, 20 years. Uh, I'm gonna assume that that's something that you'll be addressing with the Conservation Commission. And it's not appropriate um, with us before the select board, but if there's any brief comments you wanna have on that, if not, that's okay. And that's my last query. No, we'll, we'll be dealing with the Conservation Commission and all that. All right, and Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I also want to thank um, Ms. Myrak, Attorney O'Connor, Mr. St. Clair for the, um, for the comments tonight. And, and I think that the last two weeks were productive two weeks. We, we had what was a draft letter two weeks ago and we said at the meeting, this would be an opportunity to hear from boards, hear from the public and also hear from the proponents of the project. And, and I know the town manager and the planning director met with you. There was a lot of questions answered and uh, some good healthy discussion. And, and uh, I think what we have here is a, um, a letter of support that we can all stand, stand behind. And, and I think it all helped us as a town to take a look at, um, to try to address some of the concerns that we heard from the public. And um, for the artists, for example, with the, the town manager and the planning director has been working with the artist community and we're, going to continue to work with them and we understand your position as to the future use of, uh, of your site. Um, and, and I think as to affordability, it sounds like you made some decent progress as to perhaps looking into within the 25%, um, you, maybe there's an additional uh, source of subsidy that, uh, that within that 25% down the road that that can be increased. So it's, it's, there may be a few units that are 60% or less AMI. It's not something that has to be done for this evening's discussion, but it was a, a comment that, um, and, and we appreciate you um, getting back to us on that. Um, I do note that we, we talked earlier, this, your project's consistent with the housing production plan. It's consistent with the open space plan. It's consistent with the Millbrook Carter report. I think we did receive some comments from the redevelopment board about concern about a decrease in commercial space. And I think their concern really followed from the master plan that, that, that we're discussed mixed use projects being predominantly commercial, but the, the need for affordable housing here is so great. Um, you know, through the slide, we're beyond that, but I hope you understand where that is coming from and, and where the concern is. Yes. Yeah. And, and I also want to say one other thing. I do appreciate the, the time that was put into, and, and I learned this in the last two weeks, but you, you really thought out even on the open space, um, between the engine house and the brook, you, you acquired a parcel of land there to, to provide that open space. So we appreciate that thinking uh, in advance. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would like to say that um, we'd like to thank um, Mr. Ta the town manager and Jenny Rake for all the time that they have spent on this as well, as they have put in a significant amount of time over the last couple of years on this project. Agreed, absolutely. Thank you. And yeah, and just to kind of echo my colleagues, I want to thank the proponent, Attorney O'Connor, for being in touch with us in the past couple of weeks and not blowing off our concerns. You took a lot of time to address them and did so in a respectful manner. And it's good, you know, we, we had a lot of community concern and I think you took that concern straight on and did what you could. And you were honest with some of the concerns that just weren't feasible. So we do appreciate that. And, you know, I think this is, I've said this before, this is a great project. I think this is a, exactly the type of project that Arlington needs and it's the perfect location for it. So I, I do look forward to working with Attorney O'Connor and the proponent going forward to, to uh, as we move into the next stages of this. Um, so I do appreciate all your work on this. Um, so with that, we have a hey, Mr. Chair. Yep. There's just one administrative item on the letter. I, I would just ask that before it's sent out that we make sure that the date reflects the date of the vote that we're about to take. Sure. Yep. So reflected. Yep. All right. And I have a motion to approve by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Carl. Uh, Attorney Heim? Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. 
Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Curo? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Good night. Good night. All right, so item number nine, we did previously. So item, item number 10 on the agenda is discussion of future select board meetings. Um, I believe we'd put this on in with the intention that we might have a, a date for our town, our special town meeting in November. I think at this point, it'd probably be best to just kick that on to the next meeting. Once we could set a date for the November town meeting, then we can set a date for our November and December uh, select board meetings at that time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, yep. actually, I, 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 um, I think we should, if we have the time, just think about me how we would schedule things if we were going to have that meeting, um, special time, uh, virtual time meeting starting in, on November 9th, uh, because I think that's really what we're targeting. And I think the, the, the most we would slip back it would be by a week. I mean, so, so I mean, if, if we can, let's just maybe think it through a little bit now instead of waiting I mean, um, for two weeks because I'd hate for us to get to two weeks and then regret that we hadn't really thought it through. Okay. I mean, if you have comments on that, that's fine. I think, you know, as far as the meat, the, the main date that we're gonna come up is when we have the special town meeting. And then we can pretty easily filter our our meetings around that, but it's certainly open to discussion on. Yeah. I'm just a little concerned about how we would be, because because we're gonna have to have hearings, right, on 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 the articles, right? Yeah, for some of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, we don't want to get squeezed too much, you know. Well, you're the chair, I mean, so I've made my my comments. I will abide by whatever you decide. And, and uh, Mr. Up. Chair, if I could. Yep. Um, uh, first, I would say that I understand we're looking at, I believe, November 9th. Um, but until we know what actual date we're looking at and we're working backwards, um, setting any dates um, might not be as um, expeditious as possible. Plus, I, I believe it's my understanding that the chair or Attorney Heim or well, the town manager can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe what we did, what what we have said previously, is in this special town meeting, any citizen articles that would have appeared at our town meeting on the high school field, if nothing has changed and they feel comfortable going forward, we don't need to have another warrant article hearing and or if anyone whose warrant article, citizen warrant article got tabled in June, chooses not to go forward in the fall special town meeting, they can go to the spring. So, so my question is, uh, are those two scenarios that I'm putting forth correct that uh, unless circumstances have changed um, and the regular town meeting citizen, citizen articles that got tabled in June can go to our November meeting, they don't need a warrant article, as well as, am I correct that any of the regular town meeting citizen articles that did not get taken up in June have been ta tabled, that those, uh, the proponents of those citizen articles, if they choose to, not to go into the special in November, they can go into regular next year's town meeting. And then my last point to the chairman would be, um, until we know, I'm always, what's the date and work backwards, and we don't know tonight that November 9th is the date. So yeah. um, if the first two scenarios that I posed could be answered, and then the chair commenting on whether November 9th is firm or not for the special town meeting. So that's my understanding as to the, whether or not we need warrant articles, if the ones that were tabled are just being resubmitted, then we do not need warrant articles um, unless we have additional comments, but I'll go to Attorney Harm for that. So, so I think that your summary, uh, Mrs. Mahan, is, is, is more or less correct. There's sort of three buckets. Articles that we heard and issued votes upon, as long as nothing 
from the board's perspective changes, you could basically recertify that vote and comment. Second bucket is um, if somebody wants to basically re uh, submit or basically wants to recalibrate something that they tried to submit, that would require some kind of new hearing and it would be up to the board to decide how you wanted to manage that. And then third, there were a few articles that I don't think we got to uh, votes and comments on. So we would have to at least come back with a little bit, but no, we wouldn't have to hear all of them um, unless something changed, as you said. Yeah. And I think the point as to the scheduling meetings is that we should, we'll wait to see when that meeting is to schedule our meeting that coincides with that. And then we'll have to, we can always add additional meetings if needed, if there are a number, we'll, we'll have to see what comes in for new articles and what hearings we'll have to have. And then we can add additional art articles at that time. Yeah, Ms. Stigand? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, oh. Which um, my last plea would be, or <laughs> inclination that um, at our next meeting that we've already scheduled, I think we're gonna know whether November 9th or something else is firm. I, I, I don't see how we can set anything tonight because it would be a maybe date. I think we should wait to our, our next select board meeting, but I'll leave that to you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Diggins. Thank you. So I guess we, we will be the ones that determine when the, uh, the, warrant, the warrant gets open, right? For, and, and so, so we're, we're, we, until we really know what's come in, it, we won't really have a sense of how many more hearings we need. And so I think we really need to open that warrant uh, sooner rather than later. And the only reason I'm gonna press me that we start scheduling is because it's just gonna be a week difference in terms of when we start VTM. I mean, if we were talking, I mean, a matter of, well, it's gonna be like November 9th or January 9th, I mean, which is a huge gulf, then yeah, that would really affect days. But we're just talking a week difference. I mean, and so I mean, I'm just, uh, I generally feel like, I mean, unless there's some incumbent reason to put something off, I mean, do it sooner rather than later because you really don't know what the future is gonna hand you in terms of free time and free thought so we kind of have the bandwidth now. Uh, we're not talking much of a difference in time. So, so um, I would suggest that he, even though the moderator is not here, and that's the only reason I'm not really pushing really hard to set a date, he, is, is that we should set the date sooner rather than later so we can open that warrant and find out what's in front of us. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Mr. DeCourcy, any comments? Uh, no comment. And Mr. Carroll? Hold on. Yeah. Oh, okay. I lost my window. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't feel like we can set a date for the special town meeting tonight. I mean, if we wanted to have one or two contingency dates for the board for warrant article he hearings, we could. But I mean, I think in the spirit of what what we've discussed, I mean, I don't think that we're going to have that many warrant article hearings I, I unless something is is really changed on the ones that are not citizen warrant article uh, articles um i don't think we're going to need to rehear them and um <clears throat> you know likewise to, to ms mahan's point if if um the the uh citizen proponents don't want to make any change or choose not to resubmit their warrant articles those won't have to be heard so it's it's only going to be in that handful of cases where uh, <clears throat> people ask us to resubmit on their behalf with some tweaks to the to the language. So, I mean, we, we could put a contingent date or, or, or two on. I don't feel a great need because it may well be the case that we're able to fit it into the schedule we've already laid out. Yeah, so I think we've confirmed earlier that we're gonna set a date in stone on at our next meeting, I think. Once that's in stone, we can pretty simply come back and and schedule the rest of our meetings through the end of the year. So that's what we'll do. All right, that's fine with me. All right. I made my case, so it's fine. Yeah. Um. All right, so we don't need a motion on that item. So that takes us to new business. Mr. Diggins. 
Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, uh, mention you know, that uh, the father of a good friend of mine, um, Edward Braga, uh, passed away on um, on August seventeenth. Mean and and um, uh, I didn't know the father very well, but the son, you know, has has been a really good friend. Uh, he's one of the smartest people I know. I, mean, I know that people often talk about rocket, rocket scientists being the smart people, but he does um, research me with um, um, with police. Um, um, Police departments on gang research, I mean, and and um, um, body cameras, and that kind of work is really hard because you can't do the controls. I mean, and people like him uh, have been uh, the kind of people who have always made me feel very welcome uh, in Arlington from the get go. And a good friend of his um, is Paul. He introduced me to Paul, and I rather recently found out that Paul um, is the son of Marie. Kapelka, uh, and, and so it all kind of just um, comes together uh, in, in a very nice way. And so, um, I don't know, I think about Marie a lot, being, and when these things happen, you always feel that you want to, you know, take every opportunity, you know, to have, to let people that you care about know that you love them because you don't know um, when that chance will go away. So to Marie, being, uh, you keep this town together in one way or another, and um, um, I'm thinking about you, hoping that things, you know, that you, you get better and love you very much. Thank you. This is Mahan. No new business, thank you. Mr. Carl? No new business. And Mr. DeCorsi? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very briefly, so you know, t tomorrow is the uh, primary election day, and I, I want to recognize um, all the hard work that, that was done by, by the clerk's office and also by other town employees helping out the clerk's office getting ready for tomorrow. So between early voting, mail-in voting, and, and a full day tomorrow, I uh, want to thank the election workers for um, their willingness to be there all day tomorrow and, and uh, hope that uh, tomorrow if you are voting in person be safe um, socially distance uh, when, when, when you go through and um, and let, let's hope that uh, that the poll workers aren't there too late tomorrow night all right and uh, mr. Chaplain new business very briefly I um, I'll add that I the, the very well appreciated thanks from Attorney O'Connor for my time and Jenny Ray's time. I, I know it wasn't intentional, but excluded a thank you to town council, Doug Heim, who has been great uh, for the past several months trying to get us through the discussion around 1165 Mass Ave. And I also know, did, you know Doug really did a lot of the legwork of putting the bones together for that letter that the board approved tonight. So I wanted to give uh, town council that thanks as well. Uh, and I'll also add that we received word the end of last week that the town has received another green communities grant in the amount of $100,000 for uh, interior LED light upgrades at two of the schools in town. So we'll be putting out a news release on that sometime soon, but I uh, wanted to share that good news with the board as well. Thank you. All right. And Attorney Heim? No, no business. Thank you very much, Mr. Chudley. I appreciate it. And I apologize. I took new business out of our normal course of order. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, and no new business for me, so that Mr. will Chair, take... move to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. Second. A second. On a motion to adjourn by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Carl, Attorney Hein. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kuro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Thank you. Unanimous vote. Thank you all. Bye, everyone.